Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Jennifer Fox. I'm a nurse practitioner and working for the Lincoln Heart Institute, which is part of Mainline Health. And I'm here today on behalf of the Women's Health Initiative to talk about heart failure. The topic of my presentation is what is heart failure diagnosis prevention and treatment? So what is the purpose of our heart? Your heart is about the size of your fist, which is close to the center of your chest. It beats about 100,000 times per day and it pumps four to five liters of blood out every single minute. There are four to five valves that regulate blood flow through the heart and the heart supplies nutrients and oxygen rich blood to all of our vital organs in the body. So what is heart failure? Heart failure is a chronic progressive condition in which the heart muscle is unable to pump enough blood to meet the body's needs for blood and oxygen. So this typically affects the left side of the heart and there are two types, one where there's a weak heart and one where there is a stiff heart. So the weak heart terminology is systolic heart failure and the stiff heart terminology is diastolic heart failure. And how we determine which type you have, we do an echocardiogram and it gives us an ejection fraction, which is the total amount of blood that's pumped out with each heartbeat. And normal percentage is 60%. People with a weak heart will be 40% or less and people with a stiff heart will be greater than, than 40. And there are many different types of causes of heart failure. And an average of about 6.2 million adults in the United States have heart failure. So in the top left picture, you can see the normal heart. Um, you know, the, that one in the red is the left ventricle that we most commonly talk about with heart failure. And that is the responsibility to pump blood to the entire body, all the organs, the kidneys, the liver. And when it's weak, the picture on the right um, you can see that the left side is very swollen. It's very big. It's enlarged and it, it doesn't, it will not pump well when it's that big. It kind of blows up like a water balloon. And then if you look at the image down to the bottom, right, you'll see the two types of heart failure. The middle picture is a normal heart. And then if you compare it to the one on the left, you can see that it's big and swollen again. Um, and the heart doesn't squeeze well and less blood is pumped out. And which means the, the, the organs in our body do not get as much blood as they should. And then if you compare it to the right side, um, you could see that the heart muscle is a little bit thicker there at the bottom and it becomes stiff over time and it doesn't relax fully. So not, so it, it's pumping effectively, but not all the blood can get out of the ventricle, leaving some blood behind. And then that's what backs up and gets us, um, you know, fluid overloaded, meaning like we get swollen ankles and swollen stomachs and difficulty breathing and things like that. So going along with that, the signs and symptoms of heart failure are very, very generalized. It can really honestly mimic a lot of other uh, conditions, but shortness of breath is, is the most common. Uh, if you lay down at night and you can't breathe and you have to pop yourself up on pillows or sleep in a recliner, that's, that's a, a signal that you could have heart failure swelling in your legs or your, or your stomach. Um, typically it's a dry cough. You don't produce, um, any type of mucus when you have heart failure. It's a, it's a dry cough. You could be tired. You can have loss of appetite. Your oxygen level may be low. If, if um, people have like a pulse oximeter that they can measure it at home, um, particularly if they're walking around, um, your oxygen can drop. And, uh, the diagram to the, to the right here, are just kind of says, like, you know, if you've had heart failure, this is like where we want you to be. We don't want you to be short of breath. We want you to have normal physical activity, no swelling. This is kind of like um, a symptom check, if you will. How do you diagnose heart failure? So there are many tests that we do when patients come to our office and we suspect that they may have, you know, some type of heart failure. So um, EKG is the first, uh, which is an electrocardiogram. It's where you get all the stickers placed on your chest and your legs and your arms. And that tells us the rhythm of your heart and your heart rate, which is your heartbeat or your pulse. And then we do an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of your heart. So that'll tell us what your ejection fraction is, how well your valves are working, how well the heart is working as a whole. And then we can consider doing some, some sort of stress testing or cardiac catheterization, meaning looking for blockages in the arteries of the heart. 
a lot of the times um, people with weak hearts have blocked arteries and that's um, generally the first thing that we look for when we have a weak heart show up to our office that ejection fraction of 40% or less. We wanna make sure there's no blocked arteries because that wouldn't be good uh, if we missed that. And blood work is very intense. Um, lots of different things we look for, different causes of, of heart failure we'll, we'll do. Um, you know, it's very extensive blood work. And then we can consider a cardiac uh, MRI, which is a very detailed image of the heart, which can tell us um, potentially the cause of why your heart's weak and also kind of clue us in on the different other things that could be going on, to, you know, on with your heart. And it's the most accurate way to measure the overall pumping ability of your heart or that ejection fraction. So who's at risk for this? So everyone, uh, especially as we get older, and if you have a combination of risk factors, of course, this increases your risk. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have coronary artery disease, which is again, blockages in the heart, uh, the, the arteries of the heart that supply the blood, diabetes, obesity, smoking, alcohol, sleep apnea, and lack of physical activity. Sleep apnea is huge. Um, I know we have a whole separate uh, talk on this through the Women's Health, Health Initiative, but it really can impact the overall functioning of your heart if it's untreated. So what are the causes of heart failure? So ischemia, which is a heart attack, blocked arteries, coronary artery disease, heart disease, all of the same terminology, meaning some sort of blockage in the heart. And this is the most common type of a weak heart. And that's something that we don't wanna miss. And we make sure that if anybody new on our doorstep shows up with a weak heart, we're checking for this. High blood pressure can weaken your heart down. Um, different toxins, alcohol, any you know, drug use, chemo, certain chemotherapies can do it. Metabolic disorders such as diabetes, hyperthyroidism, even sometimes very low thyroid as well, and then obesity. And then we have infiltrative diseases, which we will catch um, on a cardiac MRI um, is kind of what, what we would look to see if you have if potentially any of these things. So amyloidosis is abnormal protein that gets deposited on the heart and makes it malfunction. Sarcoidosis is an immunologic disease or autoimmune. It's like, so our body is like attacking itself and making the heart, um, you know, get weak. And then hemochromatosis, which is high iron in the blood. So we frequently do iron studies. And a lot of the time people's iron will be low, but if it's high, it can certainly um, cause the heart to be weak. And then there's certain infections and inflammatory markers. And a lot of, you know, hype on the news with COVID has been this myocarditis or post viral syndrome. So any virus, you know, even pre COVID, this is long pre before pre COVID, any virus can cause uh, the heart to become weak and attack the lining of the heart. And we can see this on the testing that we do. If your heart rate is fast, um, generally, if it's above 120, and for long periods of time, and you know, months and things like this, it can weaken the heart down because your heart's essentially running a marathon with you sitting there and it can eventually the muscle gets weak. And then any abnormal rhythm, the most common type is the atrial fibrillation. So any irregularness of the heart can cause potentially the heart to malfunction. So what are the main causes of heart failure? So again, blockages in the heart. So that this is a nice image of um, what that looks like. So on the, on the left, you'll see the normal artery blood flow in and out, super easy, super clean arteries there. And then to the right, you'll see all that plaque build up, and that's from our cholesterol over time and genetics play a huge role. And, um, atherosclerosis means plaque or, you know, blockage. So, um, that's what we certainly don't want to miss. And it is the leading cause of death in women, heart disease. Heart disease, again, same term as blockage in the heart. This is the plaque buildup. And what does it is genetics, um, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and then, of course, all the environmental factors, you know, what you're eating, lack of exercise, if you're smoking, if you're drinking, uh, things like this. So heart attack signs for men versus women. Uh, women, you know, we, we have very atypical signs, you know, men will generally get the crushing chest pain and shortness of breath. Women can get it too, but we also get 
kind of the atypical stuff of, you know, indigestion. I have a lot of patients who will say, oh, I've been, you know, super, it feels like indigestion, you know, and then sure enough, they're like having a heart attack. So um, definitely if it's not something that you're, you get all the time and this is new, like don't ignore it. Um, jaw pain, upper back pain, nausea, you know, if you're fainting, that's in and of itself, like that's not normal and you should get it checked out, but, um, extreme fatigue. And the other big thing is if you're used to exercising and your endurance has, has been dropping. Um, so for an example, if you've been walking a mile a day and you go out for the next you know, week and you've noticed you can only do a half a mile, you know, that's a concerning sign as well. So high blood pressure, 108 million U.S. adults, which is 45% are diagnosed with high blood pressure. It's a silent disease. A lot of the time patients will come in with a very high blood pressure and they never knew they had it. Um, so there's no symptoms until it's very, very late later on. Women are uh, more likely to have higher blood pressure than men, especially after 65 years of age. And there's a lot of um, research into that, especially with postmenopausal women. Uncontrolled high blood pressure can certainly lead to a heart attack or a stroke. And causes of high blood pressure include poor diet, lack of physical activity, smoking, alcohol, family history. And then consider sleep apnea testing. Sleep apnea will cause you to have high blood pressure, especially untreated, can't emphasize in enough how important it is to get sleep apnea treated. So these are the new blood pressure um, categories. It used to be uh, less than 130 over 80 and many, many moons before that, it used to be less than 140 over 80. And now we're in fact down to less than 120 over 80 is our goal. And this is because, you know, so many people are getting more sick with high blood pressure in this country and being overweight. And so we need to, you know, be more aggressive in getting the blood pressure down to prevent heart failure from, from happening and strokes and those kinds of things. Diabetes. So th this condition, um, you know, causes the blood sugar to rise. Most common is type two. It goes undiagnosed for many years as well until you start to develop symptoms, you know, later on. Causes obesity, family history, smoking, physical activity, poor diet choices, and then particularly um, things high, very high in sugar. So untreated diabetes can lead to heart attack, stroke, kidney disease, vision issues, amputations, you know, people lose toes, lose, lose limbs, and then heart failure. So complications of heart failure. So what can happen if, um, you know, the heart's weak, you don't know it, you know, and, you know, eventually the heart's not going to pump enough blood to, to certain organs. So the kidneys might start to get affected. Um, your kidney numbers might start to rise. Your liver numbers might start to rise because they're just not getting the blood flow they need from the heart. And then heart rhythm problems can happen. So atrial fibrillation can develop if you have heart failure, and then it can also be the cause of heart failure. So it's that chicken versus the egg situation there, but either way, um, worth you know, getting it checked out if, if you have atrial fibrillation to make sure that you're not in heart failure. Heart valve problems. So if you have a primarily leaky valve, whether it's due to, you know, aging, because you have calcium on the valve and it gets leaky or narrow, you know, it can lead to a heart problem, but hopefully fixable if we fix the valve and then vice versa. If you have heart failure, your valves can get very leaky. And then if we fix, help the heart failure out, then we can, you know, fix the valve that way. So how do we prevent heart failure? Number one thing, stop, stop the smoking, limit the alcohol down. Uh, moderation is one drink in women and one to two in men. And the one drink is considered four ounces of wine and or 12 ounces of beer. Physical activity is huge. Um, the American Heart Association just recommends 30 to 45 minutes of walking. It could be swimming too, especially for patients with a lot of joint issues. Um, you know, you just want to move your body at least five, six days a week with, you know, you don't have to run and, you know, do all that stuff. And then here's the recommendation. So 30 to 45 minutes for five days a week, generally 150 minutes a week. And vigorous activity can, again, just be the swimming, the biking, 
uh, walking, you know, you don't have to do crazy running or anything like that. So what can I eat to help prevent heart failure? So this is um, huge. I talk about this a lot with my patients. It's diet and nutrition are so important. A lot of the times they don't have an appetite and then it actually can make you feel worse if you're not eating well. So variety of fruits and vegetables, the more color you have to your diet, the better you're doing. Variety of whole grain products. You know, you want to limit the white breads, the white pastas, those kinds of things, and just stick with whole grains, rye, wheat, non-fat, low-fat dairy products. I, I, in fact, I even encourage to limit dairy if you can, because it's very inflammatory. So we're, we're kind of moving away from dairy. Uh, skinless poultry and fish and cook it by like baking. You know, you don't want to fry anything. Nuts and legumes are also good. Legumes are the chickpeas and you know, any kind of like bean in a sense, um, which are good, full of fiber, very nutritious, lean cuts of meat. So the rule is the size of your fist is the amount of protein you should have on your plate. And then you want to avoid trans fat, saturated fat, and stick with the monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats because they are good for you. And then portion size control is, is huge uh, problem in this country. So size of your fist for protein, and then, you know, probably two fists for like fruits and vegetables. And then a little bit of a complex carb can be like brown rice or um, anything like whole grain. You can do the quino and stuff like that. So um, some basic dietary guidelines, limit foods, low in nutritional value. So packaged processed food bad for you. Soft drinks, candy, junk food, you try to avoid that. Avoid saturated and trans fats. Watch the sodium. So this is for everybody. Heart failure or not in this country, our total limit is 2,000 to 2,500 milligrams of sodium per day. We This country typically gets three to 4,000, so double that a day. So we all, we all have to do better there. And ditch the salt shaker altogether. One teaspoon of salt is equal to 2,000 milligrams of sodium. So Every time you're dabbling a little salt on your food, you're, you've already met your daily limit of sodium and you didn't even eat anything yet. So how do we treat heart failure? Lifestyle modifications, um, again, exercising, um, quit smoking, eat healthy, nutritious food, all the colors, you know, whole grains and um, you could, there's medications that we have. There are support groups we have for people who have this and kind of want to connect with other people who have it and you guys can bounce ideas off of each other. The medications we have are quite extensive. Um, there's a lot of commercials out now for all the kind of new stuff that we have for weak and stiff hearts, which has become very exciting for us because it's um, helping people live better quality of life, live longer as well. And um, they're feeling good and they're staying out of the hospital. So we, we are very excited to finally get some medications that can significantly help people live their lives to the quality they want. These are some really good references and resources of legit um, good sites to look up. Um, the heart.org, American Heart Association is great. And of course the CDC all has kind of the latest guidelines on heart wise and, and what to do. So this is a self care plan for patients who have heart failure. So you guys saw the green one earlier. Um, that's where we want everybody. We want everybody in the green. Green is good you're doing good. But if you dive into the middle bar, you know, we teach, teach patients to call us when their swelling's getting worse. If they're up three pounds in a day or five pounds in a week, that's water weight. That's not food weight. And we want to increase the water pills and get that off, keep them out of the hospital. If they're not able to sleep as well, because they're, you know, up on pillows, um, you know, that's a concerning sign. If a cough is a concerning sign. And then again, you know, the worsening shortness of breath, especially if your endurance you know, has been dropping back, huge, huge red flag. And then into the red, um, it's just all of that, but, but a lot worse, um, especially dizziness, um, lightheadedness, any passing out of any type is very concerning. 